a furtive great one on a lake of mud. A tall beast with invisible projectiles, tens of never-before-seen enemies, and pages of untold lore. The cut content of Bloodborne has finally been laid bare for us, and so, to quote Mikolash, Let us sit about and speak feverishly, chatting until the wee hours of my wonderful nightmare! <laughs> okay, Mikolash, calm down. First, the cut bosses, revealed by Zully the Witch. So, those tentacles clawing at you through the fog, that's the first sign that you're not supposed to be here. Well, that and the doorway to nothingness behind you. Upon entering, you emerge onto this muddy coastline, which is very reminiscent of the Orphan's Arena, except this place also has the sinking architecture of the Chalice Dungeon, which is really Lovecraftian, if you've read his work. And a few of you may have realized already what this thing is, Take a look at its face. It's the Moon Presence, though not as we know it. This form it's in is this flailing mess of a creature that's barely capable of standing upright. I think you can even see its heart sort of hanging loosely below it in this exposed ribcage. It's really weak, though you can see echoes of its former glory when it lifts itself up off the ground like this. And you know what I think this thing is? I think it might be the physical form of the Moon Presence, preserved in the Chalice Dungeons, as opposed to the consciousness of the Moon Presence that we fight in the Hunter's Dream. Uh, the Chalice Dungeons, after all, are home to the Slumbering Great Ones, and some of these labyrinths are in contact with the Cosmos, which allows the Great Ones to function, and I quote, on transcendental planes of thought. Uh, many Great Ones ascended long ago, and as we know, these beings up above in the nightmares, they no longer have a need for their body in the physical plane, and it would make some sense for the Moon Presence's physical body to still be down here. But regardless, it's clearly a very undeveloped boss fight, and it's quite easy as a result, which kind of suits its appearance, really. Kind of like King Alant's true form in Demon Souls. But anyway, speaking of incomplete bosses, this creature, currently going by the name Great One Beast, is this far more agile monster than many of the other large bosses you would have fought in Bloodborne, and I think it would have made for a great fight as a result. It has similar moves to Sif and many other wolf-like enemies in Souls, and just look at that face, it really reminds me of the Dragon God from Demon Souls. The Great One Beast. Would this have been a Great One that contracted? the Plague of Beasts, or would it be a great one that started the plague, perhaps? There's not much else to say here. And lastly, a fight with not one wet nurse, nor two, but three wet nurses. Zuli, who is the Chalice Dungeon's host, they muse on whether this is an issue with their illusions spawning but not going away, or whether this was just meant to be a multi-enemy boss fight. It's a bit of a mess, either way. And speaking of Mergo's wet nurse, after you defeated her in the main game, the Hunter's Workshop is set ablaze, you recall. Well, in German's cut content, he has a very interesting response to this turn of events. We've no need for this accursed abode. Let flame cleanse this house of horrors. <laughs> ah, these frightful things. Look at them burn. All ye hunters, let it be known. We are free. Free as the wind. Lawrence, the end is not far away now. Every last dream will burn out, and Flora will return from the moon. As for us, the time has come to honor our vows. Hunters, are needed no longer. You and I shall fight to the death, and she will consume the victor. The way we've always said we'd end it, you recall. Oh, Lawrence, of course you remember. There's so much information here, though there is only really one solid piece of information we can take from this cut content, in my opinion, and it's that the Moon Presence is called Flora, as we had previously guessed. 
The rest of German's cut dialogue is a bit contradictory with his in-game dialogue. First, German celebrates the burning of the workshop, stating that hunters are free, free as the wind. But in the actual game, German would have remained bound to the dream even after it burned out, which is evidenced by the fact that the dream continues even after we take his place. So are hunters really free? Second, in the cut content it seems that Lawrence and German were originally supposed to fight. Fight for the right to be consumed by Flora. That's weird. German and Lawrence always struck me as really ambitious characters. Now look at what they started and look at what they achieved in Yharnam. It doesn't really fit to me for these old friends to fight to the death for the right to be eaten. I can see why this might have been cut. What is more in line with German's story is this next bout of dialogue, because it seems that at one point, German was far more vocal about his willingness to leave the nightmare and about what will happen when he dies. What were you thinking? If I die, you are to be next. What is it you want from this horrific nightmare? What? Looking to free me? Then I graciously accept. Forgive me, Lawrence. I could not wait. In game, they ended up making German far more reluctant to give up the dream, which I really like because it speaks to his strong sense of martyrdom and self-sacrifice. But what still remains unclear in the main game, and even in all of this cut content, after all this time, I think, is what German hoped to achieve in the hunter's dream, and what he's waiting for Lawrence to achieve in the outside. Do you remember this line of dialogue? Oh, Lawrence, what's taking you so long? I've grown too old for this. Of little use now, I'm afraid. That's not cut content, that's in the game. Lawrence, first vicar and founder of the Healing Church, was supposed to do something in the waking world while German was in the dream. The question is, what? And the answer, at least at one point, might have been ministration. Writer DMC Redgrave, who is one of the best analysts of Bloodborne's lore, once wrote that German is desperate for Lawrence and the art of blood ministration to find someone who can put an end to the nightmare, who can find a pale blood strong enough to become immune to the taint of the Great Ones. So with the revelation that German might have been waiting specifically for the effects of Lawrence's blood ministration, it appears that Redgrave may well have been right. His pale blood hunt document will be the first link in the description. It's one of the best resources on Bloodborne's story to date, as many of you already know. But to those of you who don't, do yourself a favor and set aside a couple of hours to read it all. Of course, there could be other reasons German is waiting for the effects of Lawrence's blood ministration. Uh, for example, Lawrence's Beasts Embrace rune shows that he was trying to control the Scourge of Beasts, and maybe ministration was a way of doing that. And also the Metamorphosis rune also speaks of how their discovery of blood made their dream of evolution a reality. So perhaps German was waiting for ministration to achieve these things as well. But it's been years, and I'm not sure if we'll ever know for sure. And as it turns out, the one who administers blood to us in the opening cutscene originally had more to him as well. Welcome, weary traveller, to the great city of Yharnam. The troubles you must have seen. Your homeland plagued by a sickness that spares few. You suffer. Your loved ones suffer. It's like a curse. But there is hope for you yet. The blood used in ministration of the trade of Yharnam is a special thing indeed. The only thing that can cure your sickness. Interesting to note the mention of a plague-afflicted homeland outside of Yharnam, and that blood was a trade of Yharnam, suggesting that blood might have made its way out of the city. These things are especially relevant if we're getting an extension of this world in Shadows Die Twice. And it seems also that you were supposed to exchange a few lines of dialogue with the minister after the transfusion. Woken up with something of a nightmare, have you? A foul, murky story? 
Quite beyond my own reckoning? Uh, that'd be something to tell the grandkids, eh? Oh, but I've nothing more to tell. I only show the way. And the way has been shown. Now, it's in your hands. Until the dank, sweet mud takes us all upon the awakening of Ebritus. <laughs> upon the awakening of Ebriatus. Ebriatus is fairly central to the story, as it is this great one who works together with the choir, looking to the skies in search of astral signs which may lead them to the rediscovery of true greatness. As the quote-unquote left-behind great one, it seems that Ebriatus did not ascend with her kin, and so its awakening might have originally been more important to the story. Anyway, it also appears that you could kill this blood minister if you so desired, revealing that Yarnum may well exist in a sort of pocket dimension, as expected. My death matters not. It's your nightmare, after all. But the thing I want to talk about is that in the cut content, there's this common theme of characters being far more aware of the dreams that they actually reside within. I like the information this provides, because now we've heard German muse about his capture within his hunter's dream, we've heard Mikolash brag about his new real world, and so too do we hear Maria lament our progress through the nightmare of the old hunters. Hmm, a visitor. How unexpected. Then the secrets of the church have been laid bare. Good hunter, lost in the nightmare. What did you think of that beastly legend and those ailing wards of the church? I know what you did to them. It's not your fault. The nightmare held them, and now they are free. This beastly legend she refers to could be Ludwig or Lawrence, though Ludwig is closer and within her building. She mentions the ailing wards of the church too, which would have been her patients in the research hall that you killed up to this point. Interesting also to note again that dying in a nightmare is a way to be set free, something that's reinforced in the base game with Mikolash. And with German. Be freed from the night. Maria then tries to coax us out of the nightmare. But what about you? Have you profited at all? If you answer yes, she commends you, and she tries to gently lure you out of the nightmare with yet more profit to tide you over. Remember, Maria is likely here far more willfully than the other hunters cursed to remain in this nightmare, as there are signs that she has a lot of guilt about what the hunters did here in the fishing hamlet. So, if you answer yes, I have profited from being here. Oh really? Well, that's a relief. Now you can leave this nightmare. Have respect for the beast hunter Gammon's wishes. Besides, you will not find your enemies here. Take the relics in this room as your parting prize. Let them be your strength. And return to your hunt, good hunter. It's so curious that she says that German wouldn't want you to progress further. Perhaps because the events here were what led to his beloved Maria's death? If you answer no, I haven't profited enough from this nightmare, her tone is far more wary. Because basically you're saying you're not satisfied, and this indicates you may well want more from this nightmare. I thought as much. Nightmares and secrets, they'll only get you so far. Now you can leave this place. You could argue that a lot of this dialogue is redundant, but I love how this fleshes out her character and her tone, especially the bits where she says, good hunter, like the doll. Yes, it's cut content, but it's not the kind of cut content that contradicts with what we already know. This was likely removed as a stylistic choice, as they probably wanted the original cutscene to be shorter and more punchy. What's wrong, my hunter? Don't you hear the hunt calling? Or do you wish to tease something more from the depths of this nightmare? Even if it means my murder. Hmm, look at you. That glint in your eyes. 
You girl are insufferable. Oh, I know very well how the secrets beckon so sweetly. Only an honest death will cure you now, liberate you from your wild curiosity. And there is a lot more dialogue than this that I haven't put in this video because I haven't got around to extracting it yet. And not only that, but you need to check out everything in the description because down there are videos by people capable of extracting never before seen assets and character models from the game as well. There has been some really amazing work done in the last few weeks and it's awesome that a game this old can get so much fresh blood, so to speak. You should also check out the Bloodborne remixes by Alex Rowe, the perfectly tweaked soundtrack, which is a perfect backdrop to this video about cut content. I say this a lot, but this description box is full of some really good stuff, so don't neglect it. Patrons will get access to my notes on the cut content that I haven't mentioned in this video as a thank you to everyone who's pledged to the Beacon tier and above. But to lead us out, I'll pass over to Gascoin, whose cut dialogue has interesting implications for the next video, which is going to tie all of the Soulsborne storylines together. Sick creature. May you rest in peace, Mbasa. I'll see you soon. <laughs>